Hi, my name is Glenn Weinrib, and today we're to examine the following question. What is our society's plan to prevent runaway climate change? Or more specifically, what is our plan to prevent the activation of climate tipping points? After the first falls over, others are likely to follow, like dominoes. So we want to know what it takes to prevent the first from tipping over. We'll look at this. But first, let's review past decarbonization efforts. Over the last decade, the United States reduced carbon dioxide emissions by building wind farms, solar farms, hydroelectric dams, and nuclear power plants. But what impact did this have? Let's look at some data. Between 2016 and 2019, conservatives were in control of the U.S. government and carbon dioxide emissions from electrical power decreased 11%. And several years later, liberals were in control and decarbonization was similar. But liberals spent additional hundreds of billions of dollars on climate. So why do we see a similar outcome? To answer this question, we need to look at what drives decarbonization. In the United States, electrical power decarbonization is primarily driven by three things. One, state decarbonization requirements. Two, federal subsidies on building solar farms and wind farms. And three, natural gas costs less than coal. These three things changed little over the last eight years, and this is why decarbonization was somewhat consistent. Okay, so what about the hundreds of billions of dollars spent on climate? What did that do? Well, apparently not much. As noted in previous videos, the impact of policy is rarely quantified by anybody, and this typically leads to wasted time and wasted money. Okay, let's forget the past and focus on the future. Let's say someone is nervous about climate and they want to increase the annual construction of solar farms in the U.S. by a factor of five. And let's assume we do this with a federal law that requires power companies to buy more solar power and pass additional costs or savings onto customers. Okay, so how much would a five-fold increase in U.S. solar construction help the planet? When building solar farms, one eventually gets to the point where they produce enough electricity to satisfy all customers when sunny. If one builds further, electricity is simply discarded because supply is exceeding demand. This is referred to as solar saturation, and at this point, solar construction stops. In other words, there is a limit to how much carbon dioxide you can reduce by building solar farms. The same applies to wind farms. Okay, so back to our original question. What would happen if the United States increased solar farm construction fivefold? The answer is, the U.S. would get to solar saturation five times sooner. Okay, so what impact would U.S. solar saturation have on global carbon dioxide emissions? Well, let's quantify. The sun burns bright about six hours out of every 24, which means we can get roughly 25% of our electricity from solar power and Roughly one-third of carbon dioxide emissions are from electrical power, and roughly one-sixth of global carbon dioxide emissions are from the United States. Therefore, building U.S. solar farms until saturation would decrease global carbon dioxide emissions by approximately 1.5%. Okay, so what impact would this have on the planet? Unfortunately, it would be negligible since 1.5% is a small number. But how do we quantify the impact this has on global warming? The best method 
is the MIT Climate Solutions Simulator. Within this software, one can add an $8 per ton tax on carbon dioxide to decrease emissions by roughly 1.5%. And, according to the simulator, this would lower the average global temperature at the end of the century by 0.03 degrees Celsius. And we still get runaway climate change. Increasing solar construction fivefold might seem terrific. However, it would do little to help the problem. It's worth noting nations that spend heavily on climate typically have little impact on tipping points. Furthermore, energy policies promoted by conservatives and energy policies promoted by liberals are both too small to influence tipping points in either direction. Put differently, planet Earth is big and government policy, relatively speaking, is typically small. Okay, so let's go back to our original question. What is a plan that prevents runaway climate change? Surprisingly, this has never been presented. Yet theoretically, a university, government, or foundation could create a plan. So why haven't we seen these? One problem is the disconnect between national behavior and global outcome. For example, the U.S. could decarbonize to zero carbon dioxide emissions over 30 years, while the rest of the world continues with business as usual, and the U.S. effort would have a negligible impact on the planet. So if you want a U.S. plan that prevents runaway climate change, it's not clear what that is. And according to the math, we need to do more than just reduce global carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, so how do we resolve this conundrum? The best we can do is build a website that creates a national climate plan based on requirements specified by the website user. This would allow policymakers, researchers, and concerned citizens to get a better sense of how this works. For details, click on the link in the description below. Okay, so how might this website deal with reflecting sunlight? In theory, the user could select a climate model and specify how many more years they expect the world to continue emitting carbon dioxide. The climate model would then estimate changes to the planet over the coming decades and determine whether or not tipping points are expected to activate. If activation is predicted, the climate model would estimate how much sunlight would need to be reflected back into outer space to block the first tipping point. A typical number might be 1% of sunlight. This website could also compare reflecting sunlight with not reflecting sunlight. A comprehensive climate plan would include both a reflectivity plan and a decarbonization plan. The decarbonization plan would also be based on requirements specified by the website user. For example, a user might want to decarbonize a nation over 30 years in lowest cost order, without taxes, without subsidies, with additional costs passed on to consumers. Each decarbonization initiative can be summarized with three key parameters. These are the cost to society, the amount of carbon dioxide reduced, and the cost per ton. In theory, energy economists can estimate these parameters for each proposed decarbonization initiative, and this can help determine how to decarbonize at the lowest cost. We'll discuss this more in later videos. Ultimately, a national climate plan would have three components. The first would refer to actions taken by the nation. The second would refer to actions assumed to be done by other nations. And the third would estimate changes to the planet. And yes, there is a disconnect between what a nation does and global outcome. For this reason, some nations might put on a show of concern while minimizing climate costs 
in encouraging others to act. You might not like this, but this is how the world works. So, what can be done? Well, if the green option costs less, consumers will buy it to save money. And well-managed R&D can, in theory, reduce the cost of green products. In other words, consider moving money from brute force decarbonization to R&D. The climate problem is large, and so far, our society's response has been small. In summary, national leaders need policymaking tools that can help them understand options, costs, and global impact. For this reason, it is our intent to develop a website that creates national climate plans based on requirements specified by the website user. We'll talk more about this in future videos. Okay, that's it for me, and I'll talk to y'all real soon.